I would now request Rotary Ann Avan Vakaria to introduce the guest speaker, Ms. Dia Modi. Avan. Avan, unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Thanks, Shani. I'm just about to wow all of you with Zia's profile. Zia Modi, co-founder and managing partner of AZB and Partners, is one of India's foremost corporate attorneys. She began her career as a corporate associate in the New York office of Baker and McKinsey, where she worked for five years before moving to India to establish the chambers of Zia Modi, which became AZB and Partners in 2004. Zia graduated in law from Cambridge and is an LLM from Harvard. She is dually qualified to practice law in India and New York. It has been said that few of Zia's peers can match her skills when it comes to acquisitions, joint ventures, company restructuring, forward inward investment related practice and corporate law. Her abilities are recognized globally as reflected in her appointments as deputy chairman, independent non-executive director, chairman's committee member, risk committee member and nomination committee member of the HSBC Asia Pacific Board and as an independent director of Ascenders Property Fund Singapore. In addition, she currently serves, as the, serves on the following committees, member of the governing board of the International Council for Commercial Arbitration and member of the CII National Council. Previously, Zia has amongst others served as a special invitee of the Ministry of Corporate Affairs to the Competition Law Review Committee member of the Committee on Corporate Governance formed by SEBI, a panelist on the expert committee set up by the Law Commission of India on Amendment to the Arbitration and Conciliation Act, a member on the Reserve Bank of India Committee on Comprehensive Financial Services for Small Businesses and Low-Income Households, Vice President and member of the London Court of International Arbitration, a member of the World Bank Administrative Tribunal, Washington, DC, and a member of the Godrej Committee on Corporate Governance. Zia is widely acknowledged for her expertise, ranking number one in Fortune India's, India's 50 most powerful women in business list in 2018-19, and is consistently ranked in the top 10. I have to stop narrating all Zia's achievements, else there'll be no time for her. But before stopping, I have to tell you all about the young Zia. Zia in her youth was the ladies champion of the Amateur Riders Club. Not only this, she was an accomplished pianist, trained in Bharatnatyam dancing, was an ardent philatelist, and an expert in knitting and crochet. She just excelled in whatever she did. She certainly did her eminent father, Soli Sorabji, proud. Over to you, Zia. Thank you so much. It's really kind of you, Avan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. And I can see that uh, my CV doesn't have all the other attributes that Avan mentioned. <laughs> I think that boils down to my mother, who's also listening in today, who was determined that her daughter had to do everything to make her eminently marriageable. <laughs> so we are all Baha'is by which and my mother and my brothers. And uh, one of our fundamental tenets is that men and women are equal. It's a matter of religion. But my brother always used to tease me that God has said you're equal. Since when did he say you are more than equal? So we grew up in an environment where, you know, we were allowed to shine. We were allowed to thrive. We had uh, only one uh, passion, uh, excellence. Uh, and to do the right thing. And so, uh, you know, before I start the talk, I must tell you that, as uh, Avana said, I have never studied a day of Indian law in my life. Uh, and when I came back to India, it was a terribly insecure Zia who was wondering how she would ever practice Indian law. So what I tell you in the next 30 minutes, please understand that I've learned this along the way, not as a student, but as part of, being a junior counsel in court, part of arguing, and then just fascinated with our Supreme Court. So if you look at what has the Supreme Court done in a nutshell, the Supreme Court has time and time again saved our democracy, all right? And I don't think many of us as citizens realize 
exactly what we owe to our Supreme Court. So just by way of history, it was founded in uh, uh, just two days after Republic Day uh, in the 50s, 26th stroke 28th, January 1950. We have around uh, 34 judges uh, currently. We have some great judges that I will talk about and what they've done uh, uh, to make the activist Supreme Court change the lives of the citizenry in many, many ways. Uh, unfortunately, they retire too early at the age of 65 and we lose some of our best judges just because the clock has ticked their time out. So I wanted to basically talk about how the Supreme Court has changed the rule of law, judicial review, and what exactly has it done, which we don't realize as ordinary citizens, it has achieved over so many decades. So the first thing was really in terms of preserving and protecting the Indian constitution. Many of you may have heard, and certainly all the lawyers would have heard, the absolutely seminal and unshakable case of Keshavananda Bharti. That was a judgment of the Supreme Court, which came before emergency. And what it did basically was to disallow Parliament. So we have three, three branches, as you know, legislative, executive, and the judiciary. This is the tripod of our democracy. And what Parliament was trying to do at that time was to allow and arrogate to itself the power to change our constitution in any which way or form that it wished to, broadly speaking. This came up before a bench of 13 judges in 1973, in the case of Keshavan and the Bharati, where by a very slim majority, seven, four, and six against, the Supreme Court held that there's one thing you cannot touch, and there's one thing you cannot change, and that is the basic structure of the Constitution of India. Uh, it's uh, an 800-page judgment. It's the longest judgment written it has 4.2 lakh words. Uh, it had judges writing their different judgments. But basically, it said that as the Supreme Court, we have the power to review any law or any amendment and strike down any such law or amendment which affects our basic constitution, the core values, the basic structure of our constitution. And what is that very, uh, you know, wonderful phrase. What does it mean when you boil down to uh, saying what is the basic structure of our constitution? And what the Supreme Court held is what has been granted by way of fundamental rights, the right to equality, the right to life and privacy, the right to basically all the fundamental rights. These are items which are inviolable, have to be preserved for future generations. And anything that derogates from that is liable to be struck down. And that's exactly what they did. It cost some Supreme Court judges their careers. It was delivered on the last day of Justice Sikri's retirement. There were three judges who were up in line to become the next Supreme Court judges of India. Justice Shailat, Justice Grover, and Justice Segde. Mrs. Gandhi was so upset that these three judges had gone against what her parliament wanted, that she basically superseded them and instead appointed a Justice A.N. Ray as the Supreme Court Chief Justice. The three senior judges obviously resigned in protest. And Mrs. Gandhi, I think, and the government then in power was hoping that with the Chief Justice of their choice, things might take a different course. Very interestingly enough, in 1975, this Chief Justice, Justice Ray, ordered that this judgment, Keshavananda Bharti, should be reviewed by a bench of 13. And for all of us law students and law practitioners, we basically regard as the savior of democracy, Mr. Nani Palkhiwala, who argued this case and basically convinced a, judge, uh, a set of judges and a bench 
which by all accounts was spellbound uh, and with his almost hypnotic advocacy, first to basically uphold the basic structure. And when the review came, not much is said about it. Mr. Tempton and Diarujina has written a small pamphlet about it because when the review started, Mr. Palkiwala argued for two days. And mysteriously after that, the judges just disbanded and abandoned the review. And therefore, Keshavananda stood the test of time. Now, has this been tested time and time again? It definitely has. If Keshavananda Bharti happened in 1973, we had our emergency in 1975 to 1977. Shameful history, uh, shameful, shameful play out in the annals of Indian history. But there it was. During the emergency, the Supreme Court did not always shine. So in 1976, in the Jabalpur judgment, they upheld the government's legislation to allow anybody during emergency to be detained. There was only one judge who dissented, Justice Khanna. And the story goes that before he delivered the judgment, he told his sister that the judgment that I am delivering today will cost me my Supreme Court appointment. And so it was. He was never made Chief Justice of India. And then there were other judgments where after the emergency, the Supreme Court, in a way, regained its mojo. And one after the other, there were wonderful judgments upholding the Indian citizens' fundamental rights. So this is one part where democracy was preserved. Then the next piece which will interest you is how Parliament uh, and the executive has always tried to influence the composition of the Supreme Court. And there has always been a wonderful tussle where, thank God, the Supreme Court has always won when it decides who gets appointed to the Supreme Court. All of you have read how Trump appoints his Republicans and Clinton appoints his Democrats. And in our case, we have what is called the Collegium. The Collegium are five of the most senior members of the Supreme Court. And they ultimately decide who becomes a member of the Supreme Court as a judge or not. In many, many a time, uh, the government has tried to say, basically, they must be part of this process. They must have the final say as well. And these are called the judges' case, cases. There have been four judges' cases. And every time, maybe some a little more diluted than others. But ultimately, every time, the bottom line has always been the Supreme Court is supreme in who it appoints to its bench as a judge. And I always say, despite all the criticism as to whether that is too much power, my position has always been, I would rather put my life in the hands of my Supreme Court judges than in the hands of an executive whose motives are obviously, naturally, not in a negative way, to gain more power wherever they can. So the next part is therefore the protection of the collegium and the protection of the composition of the Supreme Court. It is so critical and so important and therefore it has been attacked uh, at least on four occasions by several governments and thank God it has survived. The next thing is all of you have read over the decades how activist the Supreme Court can be from time to time. And this has been in the 80s and early 90s through a lot of public interest litigations. The Supreme Court could literally take a postcard and convert it into a public interest litigation and legislate. Under Article 141 of our Constitution, any judgment laid down by the Supreme Court is binding and overrules and overrides every else, every other thing in law and is binding on all the courts, central and state. So this is the Brahmashtra, if you like, of the Supreme Court, Article 141. And one of the very interesting cases in which it has been exercised is when it came to the prevention of sexual harassment of women. You know, India did not have a law which was so basic as to prevent 
women from being harassed in the workplace. And finally, uh, a man that will, you know, endure in my memory with much affection till the time I die, Chief Justice Verma. Chief Justice Verma in 1977 basically said, we really should have a law. We've been asking the government to frame this law. They're not framing this law. So guess what? I'm going to do it. And he basically relied on India being a signatory to the Convention on the Discrimin Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, as we call it, and use that to say, India has signed up to stop, prevent, uh, to prevent harassment in the workplace. He used that convention, laid down guidelines, and it became known as the famous Vishaka judgment. And it became law under Article 141 until finally, after the Nirbhaya case, the government finally decided in 2013 to pass a statute. So the Chief Justice, uh, Chief Justice Verma and the Supreme Court laid down this protection from 1997 to 2013, all with one judgment. This shows you the power of the Supreme Court. This shows you the ability of a progressive and activist Supreme Court to change the lives of millions and millions of people. But when it comes to women, a couple of really seminal judgments, Vishaka obviously being one that has had a huge impact. The next one was, as you know, the old Shabanu judgment, where the Supreme Court upheld the right of a Muslim woman to alimony and basically said that getting 125 rupees per month under the Indian Penal Code was not sufficient. However, that was changed when the Rajiv Gandhi government legislated a statute which negated the Shabanu judgment. But in 2017, along came another judgment called Shara, Shayara Banu, not Shah Banu, uh, which basically finally held that the triple talaq was not constitutionally valid. And the reason it held it was not constitutionally valid is that it said this demonstrated manifest arbitrariness. So once again, the Supreme Court using the doctrines of the constitution Ma, Manoj ko try the, down, the law of personal empowerment and personal protection of the Indian woman. There have been many judgments which have helped and protected the fairer sex. Uh, you have a judgment in 2019 which decriminalized adultery and made it a ground for divorce. You had a judgment in 2020 where the Supreme Court said that women can work in the army in 17 new lines for the defense, which they were not allowed to do earlier because they were women. And in this manner, if you look at the way the Supreme Court has progressively, step by step by step, enhanced the equality of men and women, which is in any case, uh, Article 14 requirement under our constitution, it is through this activity of progressive judgments and progressive and legislation through 141. We then come to what else has the Supreme Court done? You look at basically the right to privacy. Today in the digital space, in the social media space, everything is known about you to everybody. You can't really control what is about yourself. You don't you never had the right to be forgotten. And everything you were and which you thought was personal to yourself uh, could be out there. Finally, uh, in 2017, the Supreme Court read into the right of life as a right of privacy. And it's interesting that this judgment was delivered by one of our greatest jurists in the court today, Justice Chandrachu who I think examined an older judgment of his father, who was the Chief Justice Vaivi Chandrachu, which did not agree with the right to privacy being part of right to life, and nuanced it and gave it a new meaning and infused this as part of our fundamental rights as a citizen of India. So basically, I see the Supreme Court as a living, breathing institution. 
uh, in step and in line with the changing requirements of society and doing what it can in its limited way does really not have unfettered power in that sense. It is also constrained by its own limitations under the constitution. But to strike out wherever it can and make a difference. If you have heard of the judgments the Supreme Court has given about custodial debts, about requiring the states to make sure that people who are in custody do not die unnoticed, unnamed, ignored. They've also given judgments where, you know, many of our under trial prisoners have actually been waiting for the trial for the so-called offense and have been in jail longer than the maximum sentence that they would have received had they gone to trial and been proved guilty. So we have a lot of problems as a country, but you can always expect our Supreme Court to come face forward and do what it can. The problem, of course, in many of these cases is implementation, because the implementation is required to be done by the various state and central governments. That is not always effective. Even in the area of environment, I remember one of my favorite judges who used to be the Green Court, Justice Kuldeep Singh, passed seminal judgments to protect the environment decades ago when it was not so topical or considered as an obvious requirement. And there, the foundation of our environmental protection and litigation was laid down in those early days by Justice Kuldeep Singh. If you look at even Union Carbide and the judgments that led to Union Carbide, those were the MC Mehta judgments, again, public interest litigation, which basically said, if you allow something toxic to escape from your factory and go into the environment or into your neighbor's property, that is when your liability becomes fairly extensive. These were judgments that Justice P. and Bhagwati, I think, had deliberately given, knowing that carbide would come up before the Supreme Court, because carbide had already happened, was taking its way through the various courts for litigation. But the PILs that MC Mehta filed, he seized on and gave judgments which had to be followed when it came to union carbide. The next thing, of course, is technology. Uh, how is the Supreme Court minded to protect technology and weave into it the freedom of speech? So, you know, you post so many things on a platform and then suddenly the government says the platform owners need to go to jail, right? Because they have posted abusive content, offensive content. So basically, what did the Supreme Court do? They said that this section of the Information Technology Act, Section 66A, we are going to strike down because an intermediary is simply giving you a platform in which you can post. The Supreme Court said the only liability of the intermediary is if there is a court order or the intermediary has its own policies of take down offensive material and the intermediary cannot be subjected to this harassment, because this itself is a curb on the freedom of speech. Our current Chief Justice, Justice Ramanna, uh, has basically also issued a judgment in 2020 about the government shutting off internet in Kashmir. Uh, and basically what he said is government has a right to block, but it has to be subject to the doctrine of proportionality. You can't just shut down today, in today's age, an entire state and an entire region from being able to access the outside world through social media and the internet. And what he said is that disproportionate uh, blocking has a chilling effect on the freedom of speech. So again, the Supreme Court said thus far, but not further. So the Supreme Court also has to balance itself. It cannot overreach where the government says, who's ruling the country, you or me. That will get the fifth judge's case right back into our laps, which we don't want. But the Supreme Court is clear that I think, I think the Supreme Court possibly believes that sometimes the government is doing a very poor job and that it has no option 
but to protect the citizens of this country by doing what it needs to do. If you look at what the Supreme Court was doing during COVID, when they didn't have vaccines, the Supreme Court, poor things, were actually monitoring how much gas had to be allocated to which state, what the center was doing, whether there was a under allocation of gas in states which were not uh, controlled by the center. Now, really, is this the job of our poor Supreme Court? But it felt it had no choice but to step in and to stop the fatalities, to stop the spread, because it felt that the government had basically failed in its duty to protect the citizens in a reasonable manner. So that comes to what is always the most, much more fascinating part of what the Supreme Court does, constitutional law. And we have what I call, I'll just take two minutes, the golden triangle. And the golden triangle is three articles of our constitution. Article 14, which denies the right of the state and the government to not give equality to any citizen before the law or equal protection of laws in India. Gender discrimination, treating like people differently, arbitrariness in legislation or in decision making. This is your Article 14. Then comes Article 19, which are your fundamental rights. What are those? Always subject to reasonable restriction, freedom of speech and expression, freedom to assemble peaceably, freedom to form associations or unions, freedom to travel freely, freedom to reside in any part of the territory of India, and the freedom to practice any profession or to carry on any occupation, trade, or business. So these are then Article 14 and Article 19. And then comes the seminal Article 21, which completes the Golden Triangle. And that is, no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty, except according to procedure established by law. And into this right of life has been breathed by the Supreme Court, right to privacy, the right to livelihood, the right to education. This is your activist Supreme Court. So, you know, apart from the constitutional part, how much time do I have, Avan, Chanas? No, you do have time, please. We can't not hear this brilliant talk. Please go on. Oh, okay. So the next thing then is, what does the Supreme Court do apart from protecting life and liberty in the commercial space? Uh, so how does the Supreme Court assist good business, assist good practices, uh, come in to make uh, uh, the ease of business better? Uh, one area in the commercial space is in arbitration. And in the recent judgments over the years, the Supreme Court basically has tried to reduce the workload of the courts if the party has chosen to go to arbitration. Today, there are about 58,500 cases pending in the Supreme Court. And out of those, around 37,500 cases are pending for more than a year. So the Supreme Court doesn't want more added right to its plate. And who would blame them? So what they're saying is if you have a contract which says you have to go and arbitrate your matters, then you should not be coming to us all the time to interfere in what you have chosen, which is a parallel, court, a parallel path of decision making. And so in the recent years, it is called party autonomy. Parties have the autonomy to decide how their commercial disputes will be decided. And if they choose arbitration, then the Supreme Court says, don't bother me all the time. There are going to be limited exceptions as to when you can arrive in my court. But other than that, you've gone and chosen this path. Now, whatever decision is, you should by and large be able to live with it. The next thing that has happened, and here we owe almost everything to Justice Rowington Nariman, who retired uh, in August. And I wish, you know, he could have stayed on for a couple of more years. But as you know, for decades, India has had the problem of sick companies, but rich promoters. Okay. So you never saw the banks getting back their money. 
and you never saw the promoters stepping up to take ownership and accountability. This changed with the passing of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code by the government. But that code would have met a similar fate of getting just bogged down in a lot of unnecessary litigation if it was not for the Supreme Court. And Justice Narima really led and headed up the, uh, the, the Supreme Court bench with decided cases on what we call the IBC. And basically he said a couple of things. One is, you promoters have mismanaged the company. It's gone into insolvency. You now have no say. Management stands suspended. You cannot interfere in the running of the company. Newsflash, you've lost your company. Okay. The next thing he said was that basically, if you have been behaving in a way which you have siphoned off money or you are responsible for the insolvency, you cannot bid under a section called Section 29A and try and buy back your company on the cheap because you've led it to the state. So you are a wrongdoer and you are excluded from the right to repossess your company. If you have structural formulas and structural uh, diagrams by which you want to come in back again through the back door, Justice Nariman said, not working. You won't be allowed. And then he said that, you know, this can't go on forever. Every IBC case has to have a time limit. Because I remember as a young junior counsel, if I had to argue a matter, I, if I was for the person wanting to get money, I would tell them it's going to take 10 years. If you need one rupee, take 50 pesa and go home. If I was for the defendant who had to pay the money, I would say don't pay anything, pay 50 pesa, don't pay one rupee because you won't have to pay for 10 years. So it was what we called a defendant's court. And the defendant had the advantage simply because of the delay. This Justice Nariman did not allow with his brother judges when it came to the IBC matters in the Supreme Court. And so you saw for the first time, promoters actually worried about losing their company. Promoters willing to bring back personal funds uh, and try and rejuvenate their company. And promoters actually seen golden jewels of their group companies being taken away by third parties who came in and bid for them and where these promoters were actually prohibited and disqualified from buying back their own companies. So there has been a huge mental sea change on how promoters now look at debt, which is unpaid. In fact, they want to make sure that they rid themselves of this over-leveraging which has led them this, into the problem in the first place. They are willing to engage with banks. They want to do settlements. They're willing to bring in their personal money because the Supreme Court has made it very clear that you can't keep being naughty boys anymore. So this in the commercial space has created a huge significant impact. It has helped banks recover more money than they would ever have dreamed of. Loans which have been written off for years and years and years are now coming back and being added and making the bank's quarters profitable. So this is yet another development in the commercial space by the Supreme Court. I think uh, probably should stop there. Just one last thing that has happened recently is that, you know, the Supreme Court held in the case of Selby that you cannot be forced to give lie detector tests or subject yourself to uh, drugs which you have to go undergo through as to whether you're saying the truth or not. And therefore, India re uh, introduced in its own way what the U.S. calls the right, the Fifth Amendment, the right not to self-incriminate yourself. So if you look at what all India has done through the Supreme Court, and as I was actually preparing for this talk and making my notes, I couldn't just help but, you know, take a deep breath and marvel as to really how lucky we are that we have such a court, that it protected itself, that our judges by and large stood firm, that our judges were not subject to political crushing or political influence uh, for most of the time. 
Uh, have there been stories about bad judges and bad apples in the Supreme Court? They have been. But you can't judge a few and cast the Supreme Court with a black paint on it. As a lawyer of many, many years, mm -hmm. I'm a young 65-year-old, uh, I believe that really what we have to be grateful uh, as, as a country is the supremacy and the ability of our Supreme Court to come to our rescue every time we are in trouble. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Zia. Absolutely brilliant. It was uh, so important for all of us to understand how the Supreme Court activism has helped us in our lives. I had a quick question. There are many more questions, so I wanted to jump in. You know, there is this new uh, Parsi where the women are being discriminated for marrying out of the community. Is it going to come up to Supreme Court because there is a discrimination? So I have my friend who's called Percy Billimoria just reading his WhatsApp to me. He's arguing this case where on Friday last, the Supreme Court did notice in a plea filed for the protection of rights of Parsi women. So uh, he proudly sent it to me. <laughs> and uh, he's going to be arguing the case. It's going to be covered along with that other judgment in where the Sabrimala case uh, was discussed. Okay. Uh, but uh, there were two judges who uh, uh, basically said, tag along, let's hear what you want to say. So he's planning to argue for the benefit of the Parsi women. Okay, good, good. So I think uh, we have a few questions here, if you're willing. Uh, Mudit? Uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, thank you, Ms. Modi. I'm a man of little faith. I heard a talk by Dr. Zareed Masani in which she talked about Nehru introducing the First Amendment, which created like a second constitution. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Thank you. No, I think that, Modi, this will not be something I'm aware of or familiar with. So I'm not going to take that question where I'll bungle it. Thank you. Uh, but you know, from the beginning, if you look at Ambedkar, and all the draft constitutions that we went through. Uh, right from the beginning, as I said, government yeah. tried to project uh, and try and get some supremacy uh, from what the constitution was adopted. Uh, and uh, Nehru was no exception. Uh, and there was also tussles between Nehru and uh, the first Chief Justice of India, uh, Justice Kanya. Uh, who is very closely related to my husband, whose father also comes from a legal background through his paternal side. So the, 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 the headbutting which Nehru had started quite quickly after we became a republic with the judiciary. But I'm not aware of this First Amendment particularly. Um, is Satyan your question next? Uh, Miss Modi, thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating listening to you. It was like a crash course on the Supreme Court. Uh, I just wanted to play a little bit of a devil's advocate. Do you think that the judicial activism is now reaching the levels of judicial outreach? Possible in some cases, yes. Uh, and I think that, you know, I, sometimes the Supreme Court, I think, realizes that and pulls back. Uh, it's always, it's, it's, so, it's so personal. Who are the two, three judges who are sitting there? What are their personal convictions? Uh, I mean, you had uh, Arun Mishra before his retirement go ballistic at uh, uh, banks and make them put money in the court to pay off the homeowners when they had absolutely nothing to do with it as lenders. Uh, so uh, some are more cautious, some are more conservative. But by and large, if you ask me, the balance is met. If you look at, so you have to always ask your, yourself the question, I suppose, would I rather have this or would I rather not have this? And does it come with the good and a little bit of bad or does it come with a lot of bad and a little bit of good? And my, my I'm, I'm very clear where I stand. Thank you. Um, next is Arun, Arun Sanghi. Yeah, uh, you know, talking about judicial uh, outreach, and this is where you lawyers are also affected. You are on the board of several companies. Recently, the Supreme Court has made the independent directors personally liable for the dues owed by the company. 
and they've also ordered the attachment of the personal assets of the independent directors. A complete case of outreach. Has any of you chosen to appeal? Because lawyers are those who are on the boards of several companies, and today it's becoming impossible to be direct. And then you say you want more women directors. Leave alone women directors. I mean, this is a complete, complete case of outreach. And none of you have bothered to go and appeal and appeal this judgment because it affects every single uh, independent director. It's of crucial importance to the corporate growth. Would you like to comment on that? And so, Arun, uh, I agree that there is a chilling effect today on good directors accepting boards. Uh, as a, a, a lawyer and uh, an individual, uh, I have never been on a single board of an Indian company. Uh, and uh, the reason is I just don't need the aggravation. And I don't need the aggravation exactly because of the uh, repercussions that you have outlined. And so what I have always been telling the regulators is that you are losing such a good cachet of honest people who will help in the proper governance of companies without being adversarial and watching your back all the time. I think it's a problem not just of judicial outreach. It is a problem of probably the judicial not stepping in enough. The freezing of assets is done by the agencies. It is done by SEBI. Then you go in appeal. It is either turned or held by SAT. People take judgment calls as to, you know, how much should be attached. But all in all, why would you bother to be an independent director if this is what could happen to you? I mean, why would most of us bother? And I think that is where the... I have always felt that people listen, but they don't know what to do about it. And I think, therefore, this has to be a legislative, proactive reform, frankly, because the judges can't decide. Let's say an independent director was involved in a decision to siphon off funds. Because you are an independent director, you don't become a virgin automatically. So, the Supreme Court is not going to get into was he good or she good or, she, uh, you know, the Supreme Court will probably want the parliament to frame a broad set of rules. Now, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, recognizing this problem, has in fact passed circulars that independent directors mm -hmm. will not be hounded and troubled, provided one, two, three, four, five. So it's better than it was maybe two, three years ago. Do I personally think it should be even better? 100%. Do I think by not being better, you are going to suffer in corporate governance? 100%. Um, do I think that women will be even more diffident than men to accept a place in the boardroom if they think this can happen to them? 100%. So it's really a, a lacuna that needs to be fixed. Right now. Um. One last question, Jaggi. Yeah. Hi, Zia. Jaggi Malkani here. Thank you. That was wonderful. I entirely agree with uh, what you said about there's much more good than the bad. But in recent times, I personally feel the Supreme Court hasn't covered itself in glory. And some obvious ones like the habeas corpus cases arising out of uh, Article 370 dissolution in Kashmir, relative silence recently on this the love jihad laws, anything to do with politically sensitive stuff, especially in recent times. Uh, would you agree and would you, what would you comment on that? No, I do agree. Even if you look at the way it got resolved, Ayodhya, Ayodhya got resolved. But perhaps, you know, in a, in a way that was politically correct and put it to bed. I think, you know, if you ask me, it's a tough job to be a Supreme Court judge. First, you are subject to comment in every single newspaper. You can't comment back. Uh, if you ask me which, well, what was one of the reasons which I thought becoming a judge was not worth the other good thing you could do, it was the constant attack. And you had to stay in your ivory tower and you could not come out of it to fight back, right? So it's a balancing act very often. I think sometimes 
probably the Supreme Court cedes to the political will uh, where it is the upward in the bigger end. Um, and, uh, you know, again, Jaggi, it depends on which part and which fight you let go. It's like a marriage, right? You give up on the little ones and you fight for the big ones. Thank you, Zia, for a very enlightening afternoon. Uh, Akshay, would you like to now give Zia a vote of thanks? Thank you, Ms. Modi. What a wonderful, wonderful session. Usually giving the vote of thanks is an easy task, but when I have to follow such a brilliant talk, it's really difficult. Thank you so much for uh, reinforcing our belief in the Supreme Court's role in upholding our constitution and our de democracy. I, for one, know that I'll probably sleep a little better tonight. Uh, as, a, a, as a token of our appreciation for the afternoon spent with the members of our club, we will, on your behalf, plant 10 fruit-bearing trees, trees at Nilmati Dandwal Gram Panchayat, Maharashtra. The said certificate will be forwarded to you shortly. Thank you so much.